Noreen, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I'm running. I am able to hear you. Yeah, Behrouz says he's connected. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I'm Marisa Masirkov. Welcome to everyone, all of our participants and our audiences from Canada, UK, and around the world. I'm Marissa Basirkov. I'm an artist and professor of media theory at Ryerson University and the lead in the project Finding Home, a three-year Turk-funded project in Ryerson University, partnering with Dr. Elena Marchevska at London South Bank University and Dr. Carolyn Lonette at University of South Wales in Australia. This is day three of our four-day symposium in which we've been 
really having a great time talking about the ways in which migration um, and migrant art practices can become a place of um, a site of home, a site of citizenship, of resistance, and of social change. Um, we're very excited to welcome Beiruz Buchani today and um, hopefully Nancy Fikian as well. Um, and uh, our uh, moderator Mehrane will introduce them more fully. And just to remind you, we have one session left tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, it's called My Body is the Machine That Makes My Dreams. And in that session, all the co-researchers of Project Finding Home from three continents um, will discuss our findings from the project and will be showing films and telling stories and discussing best practices in collaborative research creation. Uh, and now I'm going to hand it over to uh, Noreen Hussain and Carolyn Deffrin to do the land acknowledgement. Uh, thank you very much, Marussia. Um, my name is Noreen Hussain, and I am one of the organizers of the symposium. And I'm here with my colleague, Carolyn Deffrin. Together, we will be delivering today's land acknowledgements. For those of you who are not familiar with land acknowledgements, they are common in North America and in other parts of the world and involve making a statement which, which recognizes the traditional territory of the indigenous peoples whose land was stolen through brute force and genocide. Land acknowledgements also involve speaking to our own roles in the ongoing process of settler colonialism. Ryerson University, the co-host of this event, is located in the city of Toronto. Ryerson is built upon the traditional lands of the Mississauga, the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Chippewa, the Huron, and many other Indigenous peoples. Toronto is in the Dish With One Spoon territory. The Dish With One Spoon is a treaty between the Anishinaabe, Mississaugas, and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. Subsequent Indigenous nations and peoples, Europeans, and all newcomers have been invited into this treaty in the spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. We all eat out of the dish, all of us that share this territory with only one spoon. That means we have to share the responsibility of ensuring the dish is never empty, which includes taking care of the land and the creatures we share with it. Ryerson University has been directly involved in settler colonialism in a number of ways. Its namesake was one of the chief architects of the residential school system, which were government sponsored religious schools responsible for the assimilation, inhumane treatment, gross violence, murder and cultural genocide of indigenous children and people. I am a settler. My parents migrated to Canada from Pakistan and we have all worked, lived and relied on stolen lands. I recognize that the freedoms and liberties I experience as a citizen of Canada is done at the expense of ongoing violence and erasure of indigenous peoples and acknowledge that immigration has been strategically utilized by British and Canadian governments of past and present as a way to ensure ongoing dispossession of the rightful owners of the land, the Indigenous peoples, and that as immigrants, my family has greatly benefited from this corrupt system. Thank you, Noreen. My name is Carolyn Deffrin. Um, I am on the UK side of Project Finding Home, and I'm very happy to be here today. And I'm just going to read an adaptation because we don't really do land acknowledgements. Well, we don't in the UK, um, but we thought for the purposes of this symposium that it was important to do so. Um, colonization takes shape very differently in the UK, and while um, it's not common practice, um, we think it relates particularly to this week's um, focus on the refugee uh, crisis. The UK's colonization of other lands has undoubtedly played a role in the current refugee crisis, extraction, exploitation, and economic expansion benefiting off the backs of other countries in the name of the empire has not only contributed to the hardships faced by the people and places in those countries, but as we see today when those in danger must leave their unstable homes to seek safety, the UK manifests a gross hypocrisy in severely limiting their welcome. 
This is only furthered by, um, by policy that is happening right at this very moment. Uh, I myself am a US and an EU citizen, and I recognize that I benefit from these identities thanks to my grandparents who left Europe between the world wars in search of a safer life in the United States. I moved to the UK for education in 2012. I obtained a Polish passport in 2015, and I just barely met the Brexit requirements to obtain my indefinite leave to remain status purely through the luck of timing. I recognize my own freedom of movement and subsequent capacity to quote unquote, find home across lands is a privilege, not a basic human right. It is granted through subjective politics, which sustains hierarchies of valuing certain human lives over others. In our symposium this week, we aim to open up discussions across the nuanced problematics and migration histories and explore how concepts of home manifest despite or in spite of uh, the current hostile environment. Thank you very much, Carolyn. I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today's session entitled Journalism, Migration and Human Rights in conversation with journalists and, Activ journalists and human rights activist Behrouz Bouchani and his collaborator and translator, Dr. Omid Tofirian. I'm gonna hand the floor over to Mehrane. Uh, Mehrani, your mic, we're just gonna... Okay, perfect. Oh, we should also oh. remind people that um, we're recording this session and um, and also that if, um, if you need to, you can get a live transcript um, or subtitles while this event is happening. Just go to the bottom of your screen and you'll see the, um, the button for live transcript and um, and then you can scroll down to get some. <clears throat> uh, sorry, Mahrani, take it away. Sure. Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Mehrane Ibrahimi. I'm a professor of English at York University and um, the author of Women, Art and Literature in the Iranian Diaspora. And it was through my research that I got to know Behrouz's valuable book, uh, No Friends But the Mountain, um, writings from the Manus prison. I'm so glad that Omid can join us. Hello, Omid. It's 4 a.m. actually where Omid is. So it's pretty early and 8 New Zealand where Behrouz is. I'll let our guests introduce themselves as they wanted to. So uh, please Behrouz go ahead and then we'll go to Omid. What happens is that Behrouz is gonna give, an, um, give a talk for like about half an hour, 40 minutes. And then we are gonna open the floor for discussion afterwards. So feel free to write your questions down and then jump in after um, the talk. Behrouz, please introduce yourself. You're all ears. Um, yeah, perfect. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having me. Uh, actually, the, I don't know that, should I talk for half an hour, you say? Uh, for up to 40 minutes, however much you want to talk. Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I think, uh, so my name is Berus Buchani. Uh, I'm a Kurdish uh, with a Kurdish background. I born in Iran and uh, I left Iran on 2013 uh, because of my uh, journalism and cultural activities. And that's why I, I had to leave Iran because uh, the system, I mean the government uh, arrested some of my colleagues in Iran and that's why I had to leave Iran. So my story actually is uh, quite, still is unbelievable for myself after many years that I just left Iran, I went to Indonesia and uh, from Indonesia I got in the boat, I went to uh, Australia so it was a dramatic uh, journey. So when I arrived in uh, Australia, I arrived in uh, Christmas Island, which is an island uh, in uh, Indina, Indian Ocean. Uh, it is an island which is a part of Australia territory. 
So when I arrived there after a month, they uh, banished me to Manus Island, which is an island in north of Papua New Guinea in the middle of uh, Pacific Ocean. So I was there, I was imprisoned there for uh, more than six years. And after that, I had this opportunity to left Papua New Guinea and uh, I ended up in New Zealand. Uh, so since that time I have been here, I arrived in New Zealand on February, I think on uh, November, 2019. So since that time I have been here. So that story actually is uh, uh, just uh, gen general, generally I talk about it, but uh, the reason I am here and the reason I ended up in uh, New Zealand is because of my works that, uh, I mean, journalism works and the book and the movie and all of the works that I did in Manus Island to expose the system. I mean, the expo expose the uh, brutality of the Australian government uh, policy towards the refugees. Uh, so I have been working with uh, Omid Tofikian and I and Omid still we are working, we are, we continue to work uh, to actually uh, record this part of uh, Australia history and also to empower the refugees and when we talk about empowering the refugees actually we mean to uh, kind of uh, a fundamental uh, work just to uh, create a new language towards the refugees through uh, my life's experience and uh, to create an opportunity for the refugees to be a part of the main discourse. Uh, so that is very important for us to do that. And now we are working on different kind of uh, projects, which uh, adapted from uh, uh, the book and also from other works. So still the, our work continues. So, but uh, what I would like to talk about it today, actually, I would like to talk about uh, uh, colonialism. And that is uh, my experience as a Kurd. So in Iran, actually the Kurdish minorities, so I born as a Kurdish, uh, we are, uh, we believe that we are colonized by the system in Iran because of the, there is a huge discrimination in that country. Uh, so the Kurdish language is not a formal language. It's not recognized as a formal language in Iran. And uh, also uh, we can look at it in different ways, but that is uh, symbolic is important for us, the language. And uh, sometimes I say that I ended up in this story because of uh, my language, my indigenous language, that I was active to uh, actually create a way, create a new way to save this language and uh, resist in front of that system. Because unfortunately in Iran, uh, you know, we take, you know, Iran is a country with different uh, ethnic groups, but the only language is formal is Farsi language. And uh, other languages, they are at least about seven or eight languages are uh, informal language. And also, uh, of course, the system is very, uh, is a dictatorship system, is a religious dictatorship system. And 
uh, that uh, impact on everyone. But here we, the Kurdish people and other people, uh, other ethnic groups and minorities are facing a uh, different kind of uh, discrimination. So that is my background as a court, and uh, that is my background uh, for my uh, activism. So, and finally, I left Iran because of that, because I and some of my colleagues, uh, we uh, founded a magazine called Weria. So our aim was to uh, save the Kurdish culture and keep Kurdish culture alive. I mean, music, language, and just teach people how to write, teach people how to read, and how is important that people keep the, the culture alive. Uh, because it's that system actually continues uh, like that in that part of Iran and that part of Kurdistan, I don't think that the Kurdish language will survive. Yeah, so we knew that it is a, uh, actually a dangerous uh, act, and, but we already accepted that we, we should do something. We should do something. So that is my background as a court. And when I left Iran, so I came to Australia. Uh, and when I arrived in Australia in Christmas Island, actually I had just uh, uh, some imagination about Australia. I didn't know Australia well. And uh, so when we arrived in Christmas Island, they just one day came and banished me and other refugees to Manus Island. So in Manus Island, uh, which is an island belong to Papua New Guinea in north of uh, Australia, we were uh, at least 1,000 refugees. So they, uh, and also they banished the families to Naru Island. So Naru actually is the most uh, smallest uh, republic uh, system and country in, in the world, just uh, with uh, about nine or 8,000 population. It's very uh, small. So you can drive around the island in, uh, in the whole country in five minutes or seven minutes. So it's very small island. So they banished the families to Naru Island, but all of the single men were banished to Manus Island. And when, when I arrived there, uh, so I was, uh, uh, so it took a time for me to understand the system and learn about it. Uh, and later I found out that uh, actually, uh, so when we arrived there, we saw some refugees there that they were uh, transferring them to Australia. And we found out that, uh, oh, these uh, refugees were here since uh, August 2012. So they were, we arrived on August 2013. Uh, and after a while, I uh, found out that uh, actually, this prison camp established on 2001st, uh, uh, and uh, they kept the refugees there for five, six years. And finally, they transferred them to Australia, and some of them were transferred to other countries. So I mean that uh, there was a history there. So it was not the first time they uh, banished refugees there. So when we were there, we were separated in four uh, prison camp, but it was located in the same place. So just they divided uh, the prisons and divided us with um, fences. So we could see each other actually, but we couldn't uh, 
have uh, you know communicate and meet each other because we were we could see each other uh, behind the fences so we were in that prison for uh, more than six years uh, after more than six years they uh, closed that uh, prison camp manus prison camp and transferred everyone to port mosby which is the capital city of uh, papua new guinea and now still some people are there 120 people are in port mosby now uh, but they are uh, living in some motels but uh, port mosby is very actually unsafe city so now they are waiting there to be transferred to other countries and especially america and naru island they were more than 1000 people about actually 2000 people and now they are just uh, 90 people remain in naru island and they are waiting i mean uh so the history of that prison camp, I will talk about that because it's very important that we really look at the history of that prison camp and what's happened for the refugees there and how the policy uh, was and is actually. Uh, but uh, the big thing I would like to mention just to give a picture about um, the reason I talk about my background as a Kurdish is uh, that the whole this policy was uh, actually established on uh, based of colonialism mentality, and I sometimes I said it's uh, I it is a classic kind of uh, colonialism because they are using those islands very obviously as a land of uh, banishment, as a la land of exile. And they are using those islands to gain their political uh, aims and benefits. So, and it's very related to the history of the colonialism in Australia. And now that I and Omid are working on this project, actually, we are uh, working on some projects to link between the uh, policy towards the refugees and the way the system treats the refugees with the indigenous community and the history of uh, colonialism in Australia. So, I mean, now we are working on these projects that I will talk about it. And another part of this is, uh, actually system is the indigenous people in Manus Islands and in Naru Island. So they have been uh, affected by this policy and by this uh, system. So they are a part of this um, uh, story too. Uh, so that is the whole picture of this, that I, because of my uh, background as a court, that I was facing uh, and I grew up in a, uh, not the same system, but same mentality. Yeah, of course the Iranian system is different and Australia is a different country. But it is the same mentality that how you treat the minorities, how you um, uh, treat the, the refugees or ethnic groups or, uh, I mean, uh, it's, it is the same mentality. So it was very familiar for me when I arrived in Manus Thailand. Of course, it took a time that I learned about it and uh, but it is the same mentality. So now in all of these works we are doing, actually we are linked between this policy towards the refugees and the history of colonialism in Australia. And now we will talk about these projects, I think if we have time in Q&A, because it's important for us to introduce these projects. 
the, the journal that we are working, the play we work on, the book and all of these works. So in Manus Island, actually, I think it's very important that we, uh, we can look at it in different uh, aspect. But uh, first, I think it's important that we really know about the history of uh, that prison. So it was not like that, just keep people there. So day by day or year by year, the system was changing, you know, in Manus Island. So we have a, a different period uh, in that prison. For example, the first six months, we even couldn't have access to enough food or clothes or like that. Very, very basic uh, thing. And uh, so after six months on February, 2014, there was a, so the reason I'm talking about this, just we, I want to give you a picture uh, about the history of resistance in Manus Island, because we look at it as a resistance and it was a resistance and it is a resistance. The resistance of the refugees community in front of a very brutal system uh, that uh, always try to, uh, you know, crimin criminalize the refugees, to introduce the refugees as a dangerous people, as rapists, as uh, drug dealers, as uh, terrorists. So that was the system that uh, the propaganda. So, so in Manus Island, actually, so after six months, we had the, uh, the a riot happen in Manus Island. So the refugees started to do a protest for two weeks, a very peaceful protest. But after two weeks, unfortunately, we didn't get any response from the system. So even they didn't come to talk with us. So after two weeks, finally, the peaceful protest uh, became a riot. And in that riot, uh, the refugees kicked the officers, the guards out. And But unfortunately, the guards, alongside the local people who were scared, they attacked the prison camp. And uh, Reza Barati, he was a Kurdish too. He was killed by some guards and some uh, local people. So he was killed and 1,000 people were injured. So that was the first uh, actually protest and then the first riot. And it was the late last uh, riot. So after 18 months, we did, a, uh, so we got a lesson from that. So we did a hunger strike, like 600 people uh, did that hunger strike. So it was a huge hunger strike. It took uh, at least 12 days, but after 12 days, the guards attacked the prison camp and they arrested the leaders of the uh, protest and they put them in the uh, solitary confinement for a while. Then they kept them in the prison camp, a real prison with the local criminals, prisoners for like two weeks, three weeks. So, so that was another protest. Uh, and after that, uh, on 2000, I think, uh, 16, the 2017, sorry, the PNG Supreme Court ordered that keeping people in prison is illegal. 
So then they, so they had to follow, they had to accept the court order and decision. So after that, they, uh, we became free in the island. So I mean, for the first time after three years, the refugees, we could have uh, this chance to go out. And so the local, we just engage uh, we, with the local community in uh, Manus Island. And that was a different history actually. So it was a different new chapter of our life in that island. And in end of that, now at least 40 children remain in Manus Island. So that was the, the some of the refugees married with the local uh, woman. But uh, far later, the refugees were transferred to Australia and to America. And they separated from their families and their children. So now 40 children, at least 40 children remain in uh, Manus Island. So that was uh, the history of uh, that prison until um, the, in 2017, I remember, on no November 2017, uh, we had the huge, uh, you transferring, they closed the prison camp and they transferred everyone to other part of the uh, island, to the town, Lorongo town, which is the, so that was a huge, you know, like, involvement. You know, we became a part of the small community there. And that created a huge tension between the two community, I mean, the refugees community and the local community. And finally, on 2019, they closed the camp forever. They say that. And they then transferred everyone to uh, Port Mosby. But during this time, two things happened. First one is the deal between uh, America and Australia. So according to this deal, uh, they should transfer 1,250 refugees from Nauru Island and Manus Island to America. That was a uh, huge. And uh, that finally, uh, you know, the process started, but it's very slow, it's too slow process. So still after three years, after four, four years, still the refugees are waiting, many of them, to be transferred to America. Mm -hmm. And actually America, of course, gave this chance to the refugees to start a new life. But that became, a, it became like a, a part of the systematic torture because the refugees, they had to uh, go in through uh, another process again. And that's why, uh, and it took a long time and they played with the refugees for many years. The refugees who were tortured already. And another thing was uh, a medivac law in Australia uh, according to this Medivac law, those refugees who are sick should be transferred to Australia to get medical treatment. And during that time, many, uh, at least 200 people were transferred to Australia. But the prison camp, the, the I mean, Manus prison system continues in Australia detention. So still, uh, some of or many of those people still are in detention in Australia. And, but most of the refugees were transferred to America. So now they are in America. And that is the whole picture of uh, Manus uh, um, prison system and the whole policy. 
So still this policy exists. Of course, Manus prison system doesn't exist. So they closed it, but still this uh, system exists and continues in different uh, um, ways. And also the whole policy exists that anyone come to Australia, they banish them to uh, those islands and keep them for, they say forever. Yeah, so that is the whole thing. But with my work, actually, uh, I, I smuggled a phone into the prison camp, yeah, in 2013. And I started to communicate with the world. But of course, it was difficult to do that because I knew no one in Australia and in the West. So I approached some of uh, my friends and colleagues in Iran, but uh, finally I started this uh, uh, network. And uh, so I worked with Munes Mansubi for a while, um, like for I think a year, two years. And after that, I met uh, Omi through uh, an article that I published in, uh, I think it was in Guardian in Australia. So Omi contacted me, but keeping phone and having access to internet in Manus Island was illegal. And that's why for more than two years, I was working under a fake name so, or as an unknown source, but I was working with some journalists and some humanitarian uh, organizations. And, uh, but finally I started to, when I became sure that I have a strong network and I am safe and uh, So with Omid, actually we, uh, work together. So Omid was translating the articles that I did. And then we started to work on the book. Yeah, so when I was writing, Omid in the same time was translating the book. And so just we were working together, we were collaborating together, we were sharing ideas. And then we started to uh, work with the academics, with researchers, and just we expanded, we have expanded our work. So, so we have been working for many years and now we are actually working with many uh, universities, with many uh, researchers, and now we are working in those uh, projects. I don't know if you would tell me how long did they talk? That was very good, Behruz. Thank you for that comprehensive introduction. Can you hear my voice? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. So you started off with the idea of resistance through language. And I remember in the book, uh, you, you had written at the end that you're write, writing in Farsi, which is the language of your oppressors in Iran. So you're talking about colonization of the Kurds and then translating it to English via Omid. And English is the language of your torture. So it's doubly maybe subjugated. But at the same time, it's through this language of resistance, despite all the prohibitions and the legal hurdles, it's through this language that you finally create a community of witness, a collective of humanitarian activists, of journalists, of just common people who stand up and who are moved uh, by your creation. The symposium is so much about the research creation, and I see that in your work. So you started as a journalist in Iran, then you went uh, to gain asylum in Australia. You were in prison for more than five years, almost six years on, in Papua New Guinea, and then, but you continued to write and to continue to reach out first uh, through all those journals and newspapers that you would publish, 
and later on with your through your collaboration with Omid, which we want to get to now, um, you managed to publish the book one text at a time on WhatsApp. Please, Omid, jump in, introduce yourself, your wonderful work, your collaboration. I'm also curious to know where this is going. Behruz was mentioning the fact that there are adaptations coming. Um, so please start, introduce yourself and your work. Thank you, thank you, Mehrane. It's great to be here, and um, I'm communicating with you from um, uh, from Sydney, Australia, from Australia. And um, uh, I think for me, uh, coming to Australia um, uh, at a very different time, uh, with different um, uh, political leaders, different policies, um, the, the the surreal nature of my interaction with Behrouz really stands out. So. When I came to Australia in the 80s, it was less than um, 10 years after the abolishment of the uh, white Australia policy. And so for a very long time, for, for decades, since um, uh, the beginning of the uh, 20th century, uh, Australia had what it was known as the um, white Australia policy. So in the, in the 70s, this was um, uh, abolished and um, and uh, multiculturalism, the whole state program of multiculturalism came into play. So mm, my family left Iran at the time of the revolution. We moved through uh, the US first, we were in the US, and then uh, we came to Australia after a number of years there. It, it didn't quite work out there. And we, um, I, it, was, it, it could have been the case that I was communicating with you from the US, but uh, that didn't happen. So I'm here in Australia now. And, and I think this is really important, uh, the, the interaction with Behrouz, um, uh, considering my situation in Australia and my, my own history of displacement and exile uh, is important because so much about what has happened to Behrouz, so much about the, the, the oppression and domination and subjugation of people seeking asylum in Australia is, uh, is determined by not just the, the, the change or the, the, um, uh, the program or the border regime at the time, but also so much related to uh, interconnections with other parts of the world, with, with the um, uh, neoliberal um, uh, economic policies, with um, with exploitation, it's it's really essentially about racial capitalism here. So, so what's what's happened with with um, Manus Island and Nauru is that uh, it's not only a way of uh, for Australia to uh, assert its sovereignty by um, being harsh on borders, by criminalizing people seeking asylum, but it's also uh, an enormous. It, it's also very important for um, winning elections. It's become politicized to the extent that. Um, people uh, in Australia, or every election in Australia is determined by the way people vote and, and how the electorate is maneuvered to uh, through through the issues through issues related to the border. But it's all it's also about multinational companies. You know, even there are companies that have their base in um, in North America that have a stake. Uh, that have contracts that are uh, uh, invested in this particular border regime in Australia. So it's it's really a global phenomenon. It's about capitalism. It's about race. It's about um, uh, different phases in Australia's migration history, um, and and the changes and decisions that are made, and 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 how these particular policies benefit a, a certain kind of um, a, a colonial enterprise. Or, uh, you know, it was, it was really important the way he talked about the colonial nature of, uh, of what's happening on the border. Uh, I, I want to indicate that even though 2001 was the, the beginning of what is termed as the Pacific solution, which it, that term in itself uh, is, is um, horrific um, and has connections with other kinds, of course, other kinds of um, uh, uh, detentions and and and, um, and oppression from from different parts of the world, but the Pacific solution here um, began in two thousand and one. But it also has connections with uh, different kinds of events that took place in Papua New Guinea. Um, uh, for instance, in the sixties, uh, it was the first time that Manus Island was used by Australia. At that time, um, uh, Manus Island was colonized by Australia. Or the, Papua, what's known as Papua New Guinea uh, was colonized by Australia and it was used for um, 
uh, holding West Papuan refugees coming over the border after the invasion of Indonesia. So is Australia's connection with the land, the way it's been using islands uh, is, is a really important factor. And also important to understand that uh, how this use of islands for prisons is about Australia's identity, the way it was established, the way um, uh, it, it connects with the origins of the, the, the state known as Australia uh, in terms of a penal colony, um, the interconnections between, and, and also the multiplication of islands as prisons that occurred after that. So this is really part of a, a much longer history that I'm glad Beth was referred to. The, the other thing that I wanted to, to, to discuss was my, my own research or in being involved in philosophy, being trained as a philosopher, but also being uh, very interdisciplinary and also drawing on my own history of displacement and exile to understand what was happening was an important factor. And I think two things. One, I couldn't have really understood what Behrouz was talking about in terms of his own um, oppression uh, and subjugation if I hadn't already been familiar with settler colonialism in Australia. So that was an important factor, understanding the way settler colonialism operates in an Australian context helped me to understand what Behus was writing about and also the way that these elements um, feature into his own experience back in Iran. So think, translating uh, Behus's writing was also about analyzing the kind of political and historical and um, philosophical dimensions of his writing. But also the other thing was the fact that uh, I'm an academic and I'm work, I was working in a, a university at the time that I was translating Behrouz's work. I'm still working within the um, university uh, sector. And I don't think I would have been able to understand what Behrouz was writing about. And I don't think I could have understood the, um, the dimensions, the different levels of meaning and also the, um, uh, the extent or the uh, intensity of his work if I weren't already working in a university. So what I'm trying to say is that there is a, a very perverse connection between what happens in universities, what is being taught, what is being researched, the different dimensions uh, uh, of, um, of, uh, of power, the different dimensions of oppression, the different kinds of um, interactions and different kinds of limitations that are placed on academics and the way the, the what we see now is with a neoliberal university, the corporate university, the way it's operating, the, the, the spaces that it creates or the, the spaces it doesn't create for marginalized and stigmatized groups. These were all extremely important for understanding what Behrouz was talking about. There were so many moments when I was translating what he was analyzing, cr critically analyzing in the prison. Uh, there were so many times that I identified that with things that I would see um, or almost like antecedents or, or almost like um, patterns or, or designs that I could see within a university context. So I could see the violence and the cruelty replicated and to finish off with, I think I'll just say that Behrouz's book and what we're designing now as Manus Prison Theory, which involves a whole range of other works um, that we can talk about later. This is not just about Manus Island, what's happening in, in Manus Island. It's not just about Australia's border violence. It's about, it's a global phenomenon. It's about um, different kinds of oppression and domination and subjugation. It's about uh, creating new languages, new concepts to understand this fluid uh, system, of, um, system of violence. And it's about the way that these kinds of island prisons end up influencing other spaces. What happens on Manus Island impacts or has a relationship with universities, hospitals, with um, different kinds of services, with, um, uh, with e even within activist spaces, these kinds of um, uh, different kinds of activities, different kinds of modes of engagement are impacted by what happens on the border. And this this border violence is also connected with what happens in other parts of the world. It, it, uh, we can see now that Australia has become a model for so many other countries. So even though we are talking about Manus Island, we're talking about Australia's border, border politics, we've even named our theoretical approach Manus Prison Theory, we need to emphasize that this goes 
uh, it transcends what happens in this particular context. This is about uh, something much more global and much more sinister as well. It becomes part of even uh, individuals' everyday lives. So I'll leave it there, but I think there's just so much to say about um, the colonial, so much to say about the use of art as resistance, and also the, um, the, in, the global dimension of this kind of um, issue. Thank you so much, Omid. So many important topics and foods for thought. So the parallel with academia, the idea of global oppression, and also the fact that you are developing this manus prison theory as this, maybe a step further than the curiarchal system that you mentioned in the book as, you know, the, the system of systematic oppression, it doesn't matter whether, whether it's in Kurdistan, Iran, whether it's in the borders of Australia or globally or in the academia. I'm gonna um, open Open the floor for discussion. If you have questions, you can just unmute yourselves and jump in. If not, I'll ask the questions. You can also type in chat. I have so many questions. So um, just give you a minute. The audience want to go first. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you both of you for your wonderful discussions. Um, I, we do want to know what's the next steps for you um, to, so you did mention that you're working on adaptations of the book. Would you like to elaborate a bit more? Behruz, you can go. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, so the first part, this just I wanted to give you a picture of the whole story because we cannot really understand uh, this uh, on coming uh, projects without understanding the whole story and the history of uh, this policy. So when I ended up in New Zealand, I and Omid, we have started to work on different projects. In Manus Island, even I was uh, collaborating some works with uh, some artistic work uh, with uh, uh, other artists. But in uh, New Zealand, since I arrived here, we now we are working on a book, which is a collection of the articles that uh, we published in Manus Island. I think it is about 100 articles that uh, different with different aspect towards the policy. Some of the articles are about the indigenous uh, people in Manus Island and how they uh, affected by the policy. Uh, some of the articles are about the individual people in Manus Island, I mean the detainees the and their personal stories and they affected by the, that system. Some of the articles are about the companies, I mean the security companies and also the medical system. Some of the articles are about the, the, the politic and how uh, this uh, policy towards the refugees impact on the political culture in Australia. And so, I mean, with the, the different kind of articles uh, with different aspect that published in mostly in the Guardian, but and the Saturday paper and other, some international uh, newspapers. So we collected at least 25 articles and we are going to publish uh, these articles as a book but we in the same time we invited uh, six uh, researchers in Australia and internationally to respond to these articles I mean to analyze uh, these articles and uh, uh, analyze the Policy. So we are going to publish this book hopefully in end of the 2021. And also there is a play that now is ready. This play that is going to 
I think Omid can help me. Omid was invited by the theater company to for the opening of the play in Perth, but I think he couldn't attend because of COVID. So now this work is ready, and this work actually is about the uh, is uh, the uh, directed by the indigenous uh, uh, artist in Australia. So it is about the indigenous uh, kids in the custody, which is a huge matter in Australia for decades. And these uh, indigenous kids uh, died in the uh, custody in Australia. And uh, so, but a part of this uh, project, this play actually adapted from the uh, book, No Front But The Mountains, and I and Omid, we were working with them. And of course, Omid was in Australia, he could be there. Uh, and so this work is ready now, and we are really looking for uh, this project. And I think it's very important because it's a link between the uh, what's happening in Manus Island with the, and what's happening in the custody for the indigenous kids. Uh, another project is a journal that that is that finished too. So we are just waiting for the publisher to publish it. So just they are going to print it, I think in a couple of weeks or a month. Uh, this work, actually this journal is uh, on based of uh, a project uh, writing through fences, which uh, established by the Australian poet, Janet Galbraith. Uh, so Janet was working with the refugees in uh, uh, Indonesia in Christmas Island, in Manus Island, in Nauru Island, and in detentions in Australia for many years. And she collected many uh, actual writing by the refugees. So, and these works are important because some of these works are written by the woman in Nauru Island. And uh, so this is very, uh, important. So we edited this work in a journal, but in the same time, we invited the most important indigenous writers in Australia and novelists in Australia to be a part of this journal and write for this journal. So we uh, will publish the, their works alongside the refugees, someone like Tara June Lynch, that she recently won the Franklin Award, Literature Award in Australia. She won the, her book won the Victoria um, uh, Literature Award. And uh, so her book actually is about the, is a novel about the, uh, in, happened in the country, in the indigenous context in Australia and also someone like a writer like uh, Lukashenko, that she is a very known writer and novelist in Australia. So this work, we did it, just we are waiting for to print it. So I think that is another work that we link again between the uh, this policy towards the refugees and the way they treat the uh, indigenous uh, people. And also another work, uh, it is a symphony which adapted from the book and they are using the poetic text in the book. Uh, they brought it into a music work, musical work, that we had the first uh, uh, performance in uh, Melbourne. So we are very hopeful to take this work to Europe after the COVID. So that is another project. And another project is a movie which adapted for, from the book. So we are working on that too. So I mean, different kind of projects. And uh, I think in all of these works, we are uh, trying to just link between uh, 
refugees and indigenous people and also to create a space to, that the refugees become a part of the main discourse through their life experience. So we are working with uh, different uh, universities and researchers. So that is our uh, works. Just I mentioned that generally, but of course there are many other uh, projects that we are working on. Thank you, Behrouz. That was fantastic. The idea of refugees uh, claiming a space, occupying space and time, it's so political in itself. I have to thank our audience as well. We have people from Portugal, from Sweden, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and so much more Brazil and Spain, um, sending their greetings to you, sending their positive energy and support. And I, I have a se several questions for Omid as well. I think you've seen it in the chat. So um, our audience wants to know more about this Manus uh, prison theory that you mentioned. They also want you to explore the parallel with the universe, university that you mentioned as well. So if you had a chance to look at the chat, please go ahead, Omid. Yes, thank you for those questions. Uh, I'll be very brief and then I can uh, expand uh, in any detail um, uh, afterwards. For, uh, uh, first of all, Manus prison theory is something that developed organically. Uh, while I was working with Behrouz in the very first few months, um, one of the things that really impressed me about Behrouz's writing was all the different layers, all the different dimensions to his journalism. So here I, 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 I thought about what his work as something more like an anti-genre. So it was uh, at the same time that he was writing journalism, he was also critical of journalism and trying to break uh, through the limitations of of journalism and and that really became um, uh, obvious when it came to his book his, his uh, genre bending or genre breaking um, uh, approach came through with his book but I could already see it with his journalism so in his journalism he refused to uh, use or uh, adopt the um, the official language so he created uh, alternative or um, replacements for what um, other journalists were using, what the state was using, what the general public and even activists were using. So he created terms, um, one of which was um, uh, Manus Prison. So refusing to call it a uh, Manus Regional Processing Center, um, the official term, um, rather than calling it a, a processing center or calling it uh, a kind of, um, uh, um, uh, some any kind of like euphemism that the Australian state or, or journalists would sometimes use to refer to it. He he uh, was really um, uh, uh, specific about referring to the site as a prison and also clarifying that it's something uh, more surreal than a prison. It's something more uh, complicated. So there's you know it, it, even though it has uh, it reflects. Uh, certain elements of a prison. Um, there's also things about it that even some, in some cases make it worse than a prison. The fact that the detention is indefinite, there's no time limit. The fact that um, um, it's uh, isolated on, a, on, a, on an island that used to be a colony of Australia and so many other, other features as well. Um, so this is why the term Manus prison is important. Manus prison is important because uh, it, it's, it incorporates the, the notion of prison, but combines it with the space and the time and also the ideology that's associated with, um, with that particular location and also the history, the colonial history that's associated with it. So when we put the two together, Manus Prison, we have a whole new concept, a whole new way of seeing it. It opens up new spaces and it gives us new tools to be able to understand what's happening on the border of Australia, which has now expanded and the border, you know, goes all the way to uh, other, other um, sovereign countries. It, places that used to be Australia's colonies, and then further beyond that as well. Um, and I'll talk about the way that this Manus prison theory uh, links the border that has now gone to places such as Nauru and, um, and Papua New Guinea, how it, it refers to them as being, that, that border as being deeply embedded into every aspect of Australian society, the university included, which I'll talk about in a moment. But 
this idea of man as prison theory happened organically. So as I was working with Behrouz, we were talking about his use of language, his creation of new terminology, systematic torture. Um, he has one phrase that he used in Farsi, sistema hakem, that we then translated into the hierarchical system. Um, so basically, man as prison theory is about um, one, the creation of language, opening up new, new spaces, new theoretical frameworks, uh, new tools for analyzing uh, um, the kind of oppression and domination and subjugation. But it's also about connecting different kinds of colonial histories. Uh, it's, a, it's a way of connecting what's happening on the border to other things that are happening in Australian society and that have happened in Australia's past. So it, it, it's, it, it evolved organically through discussions. And, but most specifically, um, with Behrouz's book, we were able to really flesh out a lot of the different details related to Manus prison theory. And now, as we're interacting with new people, universities, having seminars like this one, uh, we're able to basically invite new theories and new interpretations and, and, um, and um, invite new ways of thinking about Manus prison theory. Um, one, of, one of the things uh, that I talk about in my essay at the end of Behrouz's book, um, it's a supplementary essay that talks about the philosophical dimensions, or at least introduces them, is the idea of two islands. So we have the situation where um, the British Empire colonized Australia, created a penal colony of this island. So we have one series of islands and another island you know, interconnecting. There's a, this kind of symmetrical relationship between the two where what happens in the penal colony impacts what happens in the center of empire and of course, vice versa. So there is this interaction between the two islands that we can see still exist today in this, you know, especially with um, um, the UK's uh, ideas about creating island prisons, we can see how this symmetrical relationship between these two islands continues. But then we have the relationship between the penal colony and other islands off the shore of Australia, how Australia continued to create new um, prisons out of the islands that it colonized, and then further into, um, into other spaces, even creating islands within the mainland, taking people off their countries and creating uh, enclaves uh, for, for um, incarcerating um, Indigenous peoples and also others afterwards, other marginalised, um, stigmatised peoples. Here we have a situation with Manus Island being used as, as a prison and the impact that that has on Australian society. So Manus prison theory is about thinking about the use of islands and prisons, what we sometimes call the, um, the carceral border uh, phenomenon. Um, the other thing that is uh, uh, pivotal to Manus prison theory is horrific surrealism. And we can see the, the notion of horrific surrealism combining um, very important philosophical and artistic dimensions from surrealism and combining that with psychological horror and horror realism. This is really important to think about because a lot of the um, interpretations and a lot of the collaborations that we've been engaged in have responded to not just Manus prison theory, but also the idea of horrific surrealism, particularly the um, dance theater project that is now being um, premiered uh, by Marugeku called Jurungunanga, which means um, straight talk. This is basically um, combining Aboriginal deaths in custody and the incarceration of Aboriginal peoples in Australia, or the, the carceral um, uh, the carceral state in Australia that um, uh, that in, uh, disproportionately impacts um, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and combining that with the incarceration of um, people seeking asylum in Australia. So they in directly responded to the idea of horrific surrealism and really wanted to put the notion of horrific surrealism on stage. So these aspects of um, uh, Manus prison theory are, are extremely important. And the other one is, uh, in related to the two islands um, connection, is the way that the university, that the role that the university plays in, um, in border violence. And we can already see the, the use of companies that, um, that function, uh, that have investments in the um, border industrial complex and how those companies are also in different ways connected with, um, with universities, other institutions as well, uh, but, but 
in university. So we, we, we see there is this kind of um, complicity taking place and also the, the kinds of projects that um, uh, are taken up. The, the, you know, it's, it's, it's much, uh, it goes much further beyond that. It, it becomes more uh, uh, cultural, ideological, the way that the kind of competition and hate and, um, and the kind of uh, uh, limitations on uh, working with new people, thinking about new ways, um, you know, issues around funding, issues around um, support and investment. So many of these aspects we, can, we, we want to argue have uh, reflections in the detention system. And if we think about the university as a colonial project, if we think about the, the university, not just as a space, but also as an ideology, we see that so much of what's happening in politics, in, in border violence, uh, in terms of the, all the multi-dimensional uh, aspects of, um, of, uh, of detaining people seeking asylum have roots in the way that um, uh, disciplines are bordered in the university, the way that um, concepts and theories, uh, it, the, the way that um, activism or community work is uh, uh, separated from what happens in the university space, the way knowledge production is so constrained and uh, and who gets to be uh, part of that knowledge production, who gets to contribute, who gets to make changes. I mean, all of these different aspects, I'm going very fast through all of these, because just to give you an indication that Manus Prism Theory is, is expanding and it's, it's trying to uh, discuss, critically analyze so many different aspects, but also to encourage action, to talk, to really um, uh, demand a kind of urgency from um, all pe people from all aspects of society, but especially academics, to, to be involved in this, these particular spaces um, in more creative um, ways, more uh, creative ways that also um, create new possibilities for, for politics and for transformation. Fantastic. Thank you for drawing that parallel. So it's interesting to see the movement of the idea of the system Hakem mentioned in the book turned into the hierarchical system that you started. And then now it's into a global uh, maybe method to uh, um, critique how, um, how oppression happens and what are ways to find emancipation. Maybe although the university is a uh, so faulty and maybe ideologically charged. But at the same time, you see that uh, a lot of universities are hosting Behruz and you, and there is that demand um, uh, to know more. But uh, unfortunately, there, is, there are so few voices that are slowly being heard. So that's, that's a good thing in itself. Um, thank you so much. And uh, maybe one last question that um, I just want to cover is that uh, can, did I, you can I just something? respond very very quickly sorry this just this idea that um universities are hosting us and offering us spaces this is true it's great to see and it's something that we need to leverage to make change you know we have to take everything that's available to us but let's not forget that um but after after this um seminar after so many other seminars after all the projects that we're involved in we go back to basically fighting the system we go back to trying to support people who are still in detention like these these opportunities are valuable but so much more needs to happen um if you know it's very likely that behrus and i won't be able to continue won't be able to sustain the same kind of work that we're doing because we don't have the kind of material support that we need the institutional support that we need. This kind, these kinds of activities, these kinds of engagements are valuable, but they will just evaporate and mm -hmm. they will, won't have an afterlife if there isn't some kind of change that invests and really believes in the work that people who are on the margins, people who are excluded from the university, people don't yes. feel welcome in the new university. If they're not if they're not supported in really practical material ways, then uh, it becomes it becomes the, the same kind of cycle that perpetuates um, marginalization and stigmatization. So I really encourage universities, anyone in academia who's listening to think about more direct ways, more sustainable ways to produce this kind of work. I will just say very quickly that engaging with Behrouz for me was a renegade moment. It was a way of breaking the rules of the university. Every 
piece of advice that I was given in a university context was to focus on things other than this kind of activism. And in fact, the result was that something special, something beautiful, something extremely powerful was uh, developed, was created, was introduced as a result of that. And it, it basically became kind of um, the basis for so much future academic work now. But in the beginning, academia, the way that it's structured, the, so, so much of the culture in academia, so much of the kind of um, expectations and the kind of norms and the status quo in academia actually discourages this kind of collaboration with people who the university doesn't perceive as academic, doesn't perceive as being valuable knowledge producers. So here I'll, I think we need to be careful also about um, the kind of support that, uh, um, that places like universities can offer. It needs to be multidimensional. It needs to have not just uh, moral support and, um, and intellectual support and cultural support. It also needs to be really a much more radical, more practical, more material, um, more, I guess, deconstructive in many ways and iconoclastic in many ways. I echo what you're saying. Yeah, radical and um, deconstructive for sure. And the idea of investing in what is not a commonly deemed academic. That's that's something that, that's a unique aspect of the work maybe that you have done. And, uh, and thank you for bringing that up. So what, what are we supposed to do? What are the next steps? How do we support um, the voices of the refugees? So I know that you are part of a movement called Why is Your Syllabus White, right? So we don't have much time to talk about it, but but these are maybe, maybe disjointed voices that could create a collective collective that may in, in some way shatter the stereotypes about the other. Um, thank you to both our speakers, Behruz and Omi. Thank you for all, of, uh, all our audience who have been with us. Um, of course, you can keep connecting with this uh, project after we are done. And I uh, bid you farewell. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.